thank you very much. Your pain is that end. <laughs> so um, the work that I'm presenting today is actually very provisional and it's new, so please forgive me in advance for any hand waving or glossing over details and there may be some mistakes <laughs> in some of the figures and I am counting on that. Um, so the title of my uh, talk and my paper is Craft, Performance, and Grammars. And my interest here is in craft and in traditional or cultural craft. And I'm interested in particular in the process aspect of, of craft, or what I call the performative aspect um, of craft. The backdrop for my work is the continuing rising interest in making. And that includes uh, convergences and borrowings between tra uh, craft, traditional craft ways of making and uh, new digital computational ways of making things. Uh, this, for example, is uh, a project by one of my former students uh, that combines digital uh, parametric modeling with traditional ways of building with bamboo. So most, most efforts to converge, uh, to merge craft practices with computational practices uh, focus on the things produced, on the end results. Uh, attention is also given to processes, of course, uh, but often only to the extent that they facilitate or inform uh, results or uh, outcomes. However, uh, important cultural, aesthetic, and creative dimensions of craft uh, are expressed through process, of course, through the performative, or the temporal, or the time-based aspects of, of craft. So craft activities like calligraphy or weaving, which you see here. Okay. These are often public or communal activities. They're meant to be shared. They're meant to be viewed. And of course, they can be very expressive of cultural values and cultural identity. So understanding the explicit, even formalizing, even computing the performative aspects of a craft might help give us new insights uh, into the cultural dynamics of craft as well as its uh, creative and generative possibilities. Uh, so as a way to understand craft practice and performance computationally, I propose using a new computational framework for making called Making Grammars, uh, which have been the focus of uh, much of my recent research. So Making Grammars are an adaptation of shape grammars, and they were developed to explain uh, and compute processes carried out by people to make physical or material things, like in all of these different domains that you see here. Taking this work now one step further, I suggest that Making Grammars might be to express the performative aspects of craft practice. To test this idea, I developed a making grammar for representing the process of a very traditional kind of pattern making in India called Kolam. This is where the cultural DNA part comes in. <laughs> and I contrast that making grammar with two shape grammars for representing the designs themselves as opposed to their making. And here's a roadmap for my talk, which looks very different from the slide that I put together, uh, but I think it will work. So first I'll introduce making grammars very briefly, and then I'll talk about the temporal time-based aspects of making and how temporality can be encoded in a grammar. Then I'll introduce my case study on Colum and last some very quick wrap up thoughts. These slides are not at all the way I had them in my PowerPoint.
Okay. Okay, so first a little bit about making grammars. So making grammars are a generalization and an extension of shape grammars. And I'm not going to say very much about shape grammars. You've heard quite a bit about them today. So the rules of a shape grammar generate designs by computing directly with shapes. The rules involve seeing and doing. If you see a shape A, then basically do the shape B. Do as shown by the shape B. So designing with shape grammars is about doing and sensing with spatial elements to make shapes, or more specifically, drawing and seeing with points, lines, planes, and solids to make shapes. This definition of designing can be extended very straightforwardly to a definition of making, where making is doing and sensing stuff or materials to make things. Doing is any action, including drawing, holding, not in typing, and so on. Sensing includes seeing and the use of our other senses, touching, getting, smelling, feeling, and even thinking. Uh, stuff includes materials, uh, and it can include abstract stuff like lines. Things are finite physical things made of stuff, including abstract things like shapes. With these definitions in hand, in hand shape grammars for computing with shapes can be generalized to making grammars for computing or making things. The rules of a making grammar have this general form. They look the same as shape rules, except now we're computing with things as opposed to computing or calculating with shapes. And then making rules can be further distinguished as see, uh, sorry, sensing rules or doing rules. A sensing rule represents uh, sensory interactions with the thing, with a thing, for example, you know, uh, moving your uh, hands, grasping things with the hands, or seeing things with your eyes. Doing rules represent physical actions on a thing or with a thing, like holding, nodding, drawing, or whatever. And sensing and doing can sometimes be inseparable, in which case of making rule will do both of them both simultaneously. In my preliminary work on making grammars, I gave uh, an example of a making grammar for knotting strings, which was inspired by kipu. Kipu, kipu are the knotted strings made by the Incas as a physical record keeping in communication language. The grammar gener generates multiple overhand knots, like the ones you see here, uh, along the string. <coughs> Sensing rules for touching or grasping strings. Sorry, the rules are on the left. The uh, computation with the rules are on the right. And I apologize for the fuzziness of uh, the drawing. So the computation uh, shows a step by step uh, calculation, the physical making of a knotted string. So this grammar is obviously very, very schematic, but it suggests that the possibilities for rules to encode temporal qualities of physical not making the rules capture not, very natural stopping or stable points in a continuous knotting process, which brings me to the next part of my paper and my talk, making grammars and making time. So a key feature of making things is time. Craft practices and making in general are continuous temporal events. Making something necessarily involves structuring, structuring in some way the spatial properties of the thing as it's being made. And it also involves structuring the, the temporal properties of making the thing. Studies of the temporal aspects of craft and other creative making activities are, are very few. However, there's lots and lots and lots of research on the temporal aspects of routine, everyday activities like drinking the cup coffee, making a bed, giving a conference talk, if you consider that routine. Um, in cognitive science and psychology, for example, researchers try to figure out how people make sense of the continuous, fluctuating, multi-sensory stream of information and actions in the world. And uh, a central idea here is that in order to understand what's happening in the world, People discretize or chunk 
continuous flow of events into temporal parts or temporal segments. In computer science, researchers take a very functional and application-oriented approach. Here the objective is to understand human motions in order to build computational models that recognize and recognize and generate human-like actions. In robotics, um, in particular, researchers are, of course are interested in building robots to understand and simulate human actions. And researchers also very often turn to grammars and rules as a way to represent and parse actions over time. In all of this work, what's really key, again, is the segmentation or decomposition of actions into discrete, bounded, temporal primitives. So the idea behind making grammars overlaps with some of these ideas. But making grammars are directed toward creative human activities, not routine uh, activities like slicing an apple or making a bit. Slicing an apple is a favorite example of researchers in, in all fields. OK, so the how then does or can kind of making grammar uh, represent or define a temporal making process? So it does that through its rules in kind of an obvious and natural way. When a making rule is m goes to n is applied to some thing, it segments that thing spatially into m and its other parts in the same way that a shape rule segments a shape spatially. In addition, a making rule suggests a temporal segmentation. The arrow or replacement of operation in a rule can be interpreted as an action in time. It represents a temporal segment of a continuous process. In other words, when a making rule is applied to thing, say T1, to make it into another thing, T2, it segments a making process into temporal breakpoints or boundaries defined by T1 and T2. So to test, to see, to test um, how this might work for a real practice, I looked at column making in India. And I was actually already familiar with the column because I'd written a little shape round with the column pattern several years ago. So first a little background about column. So column are traditionally made by women on the thresholds of their homes. This is a highly skilled practice taught to girls from a, a very young age, a very nice example of cultural DNA. It's passed from one, <laughs> one generation to another, so it really is cultural DNA. Um, the patterns are made with very finely ground rice powder that's trickled in a thin stream from between the fingers onto the ground. First, the woman places uh, a regularly spaced grid of dots on the ground, and then she drops the rice powder in a line that loops around the dots, intersecting itself repeatedly, and coming right back to the starting point um, at the end. Patterns almost always have some kind of rotation or reflective symmetry. And here's another much more complex pattern. It's kind of mind-boggling to try to figure out how they do this, but really this was my, this is what I was really curious about. How do they do this? The uh, column are rich with aesthetic and cultural significance. The performance, the making of the column, is an especially important part of Poland folklore and considered to be the locus of creativity, the making of the patterns themselves. Here are some other tra traditional examples of uh, some examples of traditional patterns. Computer scientists and mathematicians have analyzed these patterns to death <laughs> in terms of graphs, combinatorics, array grammars, L grammars, L systems, and other mathematics structures, but very little has been written about how women actually make or calculate these patterns on the fly. And I have a short clip, but I'm not sure how I get started.
first couple of steps, mirrors are placed, and then uh, a line begins and is extended cell by cell through the, the, uh, uh, so it's through the grid to generate the same design that we saw before. So here's the beginning of the line, and then it's extended, and it bounces off mirrors, and it comes back to the starting point. that aren't shown there. Okay, so this grammar generates exactly the same uh, designs uh, that we saw with the modular motif grammar. It implies another very simple and efficient way to compute all of patterns. Because it generates patterns by continuously extending a line, it's more suggestive of actual column making than the previous grammar, but the placement of mirrors at the beginning of a computation suggests a very fixed pre-planning of a design uh, that may not be reflective of actual performance. And also the step-by-step, cell-by-cell drawing of a line seems an inadequate temporal segmentation of an actual performance. The next grammar, a making grammar, begins to, just begins to address these deficiencies. Uh, and this grammar is called a line on a walk. Familiar. It's called A Line on a Walk after the artist Paul Clay's well-known portrait of characterization of a line as out on a walk, as a point that sets itself in motion. In other words, uh, a line as the trace of movement. And here are the rules. And you can see right away there are many more rules here than the previous shape grammars, and they only begin to capture the line of making of the colon. But they encode a very different way of uh, calculating colon than shape grammars. When I started looking at live performances of colon making, by watching lots and lots of videos, I discovered a generative strategy that had just not occurred to me at all looking at the completed patterns. The basic principle at work here uh, is weaving, weaving between the dots. When women make colon, they don't have an organizational square grid on the ground, they just have the dots. And what they do, what they appear to do, is weave a line through pairs of dots, one or more pairs of dots at a time, and the length of each line or stroke that they make basically has to do with whether or how the line curves, the complexity of the gesture. Uh, rules here are divided into seam rules and drawing rules that come in pairs. Drawing always follows seam. So the idea here is that the column maker continually looks ahead to see where the next dots lie on the ground and decide then which way the line should go. Uh, the seam component identifies in red, here you see the red dots, the dots that the maker sees as the next pair of dots to walk the line. Uh, rule one up at the top starts a line and it can continue from either end. And then the following rules are grouped according to how a line takes its walk uh, by night on a straight path initially by 90 degrees or with a, uh, a 180 or 270 or 360 degree turn. The square here that's uh, made up of dashed lines is used only as a registration mark and the rules is actually not a part. Of computations. Okay, so how does this relate to temporality? Well, applying the rules segment the making of a column into discrete seeing and drawing actions in time. Drawing actions are defined by the length of a line and its curvature, more or less by the complexity of the gesture required. Seeing rules also segment time. And here I assume that the seeing, segment, the seeing segments are short and might even be simultaneous with drawing. So obviously the segmentations that I've defined are very conjectural and simplifications of what actually happens in practice, but they begin to suggest a way to understand the temporal structure along with the spatial structure of colon making. And here is a computation that generates the same pattern that we saw before with the two previous shape renders. 
computations with this grammar are longer. They take more time than with the shape grammars. And again, it's basically a weaving process weaving through the dots. So to wrap up some quick thoughts about this to be continued project. So my main interest here was to explore the role of temporality in crafts or other creative making or designing practices. Making grammars suggest a way to represent temporality in rigorous computational terms. Uh, this kind of rule-based temporal uh, analysis has interesting creative potentials, which I have yet to explore. For example, playing around with alternative uh, temporal parts or segmentations of an activity or rearranging uh, temporal parts might suggest new ways of making things. Uh, also, the timing or duration of segments might also have creative implications. Uh, in general, I think there's a lot more that we can do with computation and with rules to understand and, and to advance what we often take as tacit or implicit or just under its order, under, under
series called um, series by a company called Wooden Books. That um, in one of the books, I think it's called the Design and Book. There's an account of Celtic patterns that seem to use the mirror grammar and stuff, and it's irritatingly incomplete. The mirror grammar, yeah. The uses the mirror grammar to yeah. generate Celtic patterns. Yeah. Have you seen um, mirror grammars used in Celtic patterns? Yeah, the one.
and in a simple way, I should have I start thinking whether this design is here. They have to do uh, because they can be generated in a variety of ways, including opera or pencil or rice, you know. Uh, but also other ways of making things, you know. So I was I was thinking whether the there's something about the, the amount of rice you can hold in your palm and the speed, you know, so yeah. And, uh, that's, that's I was thinking whether this different different ways of producing these designs would, would make different designs. My interest Sense of how this works. Incredible. Much better sense. It's one of the benefits of writing. 